honoured to be invited to, to join you today and to share a few reflections. And I'm, although my university is in Birmingham, I, I've re, um, I have journeyed out today to London, my first train journey for 15 months. Um, and it's lovely to be sitting here uh, on a very sunny morning. So, um, as Rosemary has said, I'm going to give some reflections. And I don't think I will m be mentioning things that many of you haven't thought of before, but I thought that it was quite a good thing to give quite a personal account of the last 15, 16 months and to see later when we're having the discussion how my thoughts and reflections resonate, resonate with what you've experienced. So I intend to accomplish the task of thinking about a, a resilient university and what we've learned by drawing on my own personal experience of heading an institution um, and leading change through the pandemic and then to consider what we might what that might mean for long term learning and teaching practice. And over the last couple of years, I've moved away from using slides, so no slides. Um, I think it allows you to listen better and for me to be more authentic. So no slides, but the script of my keynote uh, will be available afterwards. So just a bit of background. Um, as Rosemary said, um, I have been um, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Aston, but on the 1st of March, I stepped down from running a university, um, at which I had been doing this for 10 years. And so I suppose it's given me over the last two months, three months, a sense of being really being able to look back at uh, my time over the last 18 months and to look at it um, without the day to day hassle of still continue doing it. And I suppose that gives me quite a privileged um, um, position. So during the last year, I, I led our university's endeavours to bring together all aspects of the response to the pandemic. Um, and we entitled this Aston Students First. And this involved coordinating across many aspects of our university lockdown life and bringing them all together. And I suppose that's my first learning that um, sometimes universities have been accused of working in silos. And I would say um, why our university was more resilient than I expected and certainly a learning that I'll use in future is that for once the silos came together. And so the things that I was coordinating were uh, liaising with the critical incident team, looking after the operational side of life on campus for staff and students and visitors, running the library which we kept open throughout the last year as the main hub for students who had to be or wanted to be on campus. There was the Aston Delivery Group looking at changes in academic delivery, both on and off campus, and drawing in the academic colleges to work in best practice. Um, working in, again, I think a, a greater partnership across disciplines than we'd ever done before. And also working with our central education and learning development teams, really giving them an opportunity to be embedded into the life of the colleges. Another thing that I was coordinating was creating the assessment policies and practices to make sure that no student was disadvantaged by their pandemic experience. Um, but that our academic standards were still maintained. And also looking after student welfare and support, for example, in terms of 
lack of IT access and also increasingly uh, looking at their mental health resilience. Um, and another thing that I know will resonate with some of you um, on this session is, is looking after students who are on placement in this country um, or abroad. Uh, the majority of our degrees have a compulsory placement year and we needed to make sure that the students still had a fulfilling experience which invested in their future employability. We know that uh, many universities in the UK uh, allowed their students not to go on placement. We made a decision because we think that our placement is life transforming for uh, students, particularly from low participation groups, that we wouldn't cancel it. And that put a responsibility on us to make sure that the experience was just as good as it might have been, even though it was different. And then finally, ensuring that all, all this was communicated successfully to staff and students. And you'll see as I go through my talk that the communication part is the thing that I think I've learned most about um, and have thought um, more about in how we use that going forward. So I, I know that uh, all of you have been involved in these things in your own institutions. So as I start to reflect, I've, I've looked back at an article that I published in the conversation uh, in September 2020. Um, and this is a, was really useful because it was a reminder of how I felt in those optimistic times a year, a year to nine months ago. Um, and it's an opportunity to contemplate what's happened since and, and gauge whether our learnings have changed our approaches and practice as a result, even in that fairly short period of time. And in, in the article entitled How Universities Can Ensure Students Still Have a Good Experience Despite Coronavirus, I summarised life as we hoped it would be during the current academic year. And even back then, it was already acknowledged that certainly UK university students were experiencing experiencing a different way of life. And I, I, I'm sure that that's the same in many areas of the world. Some students had already found themselves in lockdown in their residences, um, and others were afraid that they wouldn't be getting some of the usual benefits of a, a, a university education. And in my conversation article, I said that universities have a duty of care for students' health and well-being and a responsibility to ensure that the students of 2021 experience a high quality, engaging and innovative learning experience. I went on, it's important to universities that they provide excellent student satisfaction and they are judged on this by students and the government. So far, it looks very possible that students will rate their experiences less satisfying than usual. I suggest there are a number of vital ways in which universities can ensure student satisfaction and continued value for money. So what I thought I'd do now is I would go through the actions that I suggested then in my article, see whether they're still valid and identify whether anything new has emerged since and I, I'd like to first of all start with a message about listening. New students uh, often find their first term disorienting. And this academic year, there were additional learning and teaching challenges to deal with, notably managing the use of new technologies and attending face to face sessions with social distancing in place. And to maintain student satisfaction and manage expectations, I said in my original article that universities would have to find ways to listen attentively to students. And institutions may have been doing 
all they could to support students. I, I, I know that that's central to what everyone here today uh, uh, believes and, and, and tries to do. But it's not always felt like that to students themselves. And so universities need to survey student views regularly and make changes based on these views so that students find universities to be responsive, more responsive to their needs. And, and universities mustn't treat learners as one homogenous group. There were not going to be one size fits all for the pandemic changes that we had to make. Some students uh, were keen on online sessions and others felt only felt comfortable if everything was online. I remember a discussion uh, uh, last summer where we were getting messages saying I will only enrol if it's on campus and other ones saying I will only enrol if it's off campus. So how do you satisfy everyone? So universities have to design learning which can be flexed either way according to student demand but also as we've seen from the changing pandemic restrictions. And this needed to be done with speed and agility, sometimes that universities are not known for. And I'll come back to that later. My second point leads on from listening and it's about keep in touch. So institutions have had to communicate, communicate to students more than they've ever done before and via multiple channels. We already knew that students say that email is not the best form of communication, but we've had to be even more creative in the last year. And at this stage, please, please allow me the first of a slight, a number of slight diversions. I wanted to reflect on one of the most terrible times of my life. It was in early May 2020. I was responsible for moving the assessment of my university online and for producing a new no detriment policy for student assessment. And we worked really hard on this. We, we, we tried to be to nuance it, to be flexible, to be very uh, responsive to different groups of students. And we sent out an email to all students explaining our approach. And within half an hour, there were 200 messages in my inbox from students. And over the next three days, that rose to over a thousand. And these were accompanied by two enormous petitions. And what I discovered was that, that half an hour after uh, I had sent out our email, the university down the road had published their no detriment policy and the headline for them was they had cancelled all exams. And students couldn't understand why we'd done, we hadn't done the same. In fact, one said, well, you're not a Russell group university, you should be doing the same um, as the Russell group. And my reply was, well, I'm doing the same looking at the individual needs of all of our students, whoever their backgrounds are, whatever their backgrounds are. And, but the students only read the headlines. As I got up at 4 a.m. each morning that week and replied to the 1,000 emails individually and talked to a number of students who'd all organised the petition, I learned a lot. I moved to a much simpler approach perhaps a, a more, even more individualised approach afterwards. And so I moved to uh, more interactive ways of connecting, such as virtual question and answer sessions. I did a lot of individual phone calls, replying to individual questions. And, and uh, my social media expertise got a great more, a, a large, a, a much more effective. So I think student uh, universities have a responsibility to explain what they're doing 
from a student's point of view and to tailor their responses to different students. And, and I really did learn from that. And finally, uh, universities need to take good use of technology. Paradoxically, this medium, which was a response to having to educate at a, diff at, at a distance, has become the means by which universities can offer a more individualised, a more flexible, a more engaging, a more an experience that feels more intimate in many ways. And for example, online learning and communication should allow for new one-to-one -one conversations on study and progress informed by data on students' engagement with their learning. Uh, and at this stage, please allow me a, a, another digression. I've been responsible for bringing learner analytics to my university over the past few years, and we found it to be very enabling, particularly for students who've embraced it faster and far more enthusiastically than staff. And they've liked the fact that, that you can get a, a dashboard of your performance and you can monitor your engagement. And we've also used it to target those students who are more at risk at, of not progressing. And if you're interested in, in how we've used it, I can point you to a paper we've written, Summers, Moores and Higson 2020, in which we were able to identify that those students who engage well in the first few weeks of term do better at the end of the year, even if their engagement drops off, than those student colleagues who increase their engagement as the year goes on. And this is really frightening for many uh, policies. We, we all spend a lot of time trying to increase student engagement when really the message from our research is you've really you've got to engage in those first three to five weeks with everyone. So clear policy and practice message about that first three to five weeks. Uh, you need to start engaging with students even before the beginning of their time at the university. And that's certainly another of my learnings. So let's come to my third point. Um, invest in staff and students. All these innovative ways of working may not be easy for some staff. <clears throat> In the new environment, each teacher needs to be as comfortable and needs to be have the opportunity to be as creative with the blended learning technologies they, they were using. They are using as those that they previously used face to face. And more than this, they need to have the time to rethink their approaches to designing and delivering and assessing everything that they taught before. As ever, if you want a high quality project product, you need to invest and universities pride themselves on the excellence of their learning experience. So as well as resourcing extensive extra investment in hardware and software and networking capacity, it's been very necessary to invest in the training and support of staff. And staff have needed the tools to ensure consistency and innovation and excellence of design. And, and, and a third diversion. At our university, we designed three modules last summer to upskill our staff, uh, to be able to help them prepare for the 2020 delivery agenda. The first one was on designing blended learning. One was on delivering blended learning and the third on assessing blended learning. <clears throat> and we made it compulsory for every lecturer to take these. We felt that we were investing in the confidence of our staff to deliver high quality learning um, that was of at least as high quality um, as 
they had been producing before. But the other thing was, we knew that students hate variability. And so we were trying to make sure that there was a, an equally high quality and equally well designed um, experience for all students. Of course, students have also needed uh, a lot of support at this time in order to take full advantage of the imaginative technical technological approach approaches on Aston uh, on offer. All this is not cheap. Um, but it's very positive and necessary investment. We, for example, used our university drivers to drive uh, laptops to students where they had no uh, no hardware and we um, spent a lot of time looking at students learning as environment in their homes where it was often quite difficult when there were other siblings having homeschooling and I'm sure um, others of you will have been aware, aware of similar uh, initiatives. So it's interesting to look back at what I said then and that all the main themes seem to do, seem to be about people. Yes, I mentioned technology and other sorts of physical support, but the real messages that I continue to see as of paramount perform importance are those regarding people. Good leadership, good people management, motivation and support, coupled with excellent listening to and communication to all stakeholders are clearly fundamental. Let's start with the student dimension. In their May 2021 wonky article, Badri and Longdon say, while there are many lessons from this period, it may come as no surprise that we believe that there is one we must focus on above all listening to students and ensuring that they are actively involved in the design, delivery and evaluation of their learning and teaching experience. That's what real student partnership is about. If they continue, an institution plans to translate their experience over the past year into a longer term strategy, then that strategy can only succeed if it's built on meaningful collaboration with students. This is not a new or radical idea. It's what should have been happening before the pandemic, and it's what needs to happen going forward. Students shouldn't simply be asked for their feedback once plans are implemented. Rather, they should be involved in their construction, implementation, in evaluation to ensure that effective improvements are made. So I would say that if we're going to be resilient universities, we need to learn from what we have experimented with during the pandemic on how we encourage collaboration. And this needs to be a more united approach among staff as well among, as among students. In another um, article in Wonky, Jessup um, and colleagues talked about this. They talked about new ways of building community among staff which could be through collaborative course development. They be believe that the, the days of the lone academic, the lone module leader creating their own modules is probably over. And I totally agree. My next learning is about technology, but not so much technology for its own sake, but as one of a range of tools to create an excellent learning experience excellent learning experiences and also facilitating that relationship of students and staff with te other technological approaches and in my in original article <clears throat> i said that i feared that the 2021 approaches to learning would lead to less satisfactory learning in the eyes of many students actually this does not seem to have been the case. We've seen the shift from emergency remote learning 
which students were mostly understanding about last academic year when we had 48 hours to transform our delivery to, to more carefully designed approaches this academic year. And now we need to take the most effect, effective of each approach for each situation to create the best possible COVID learning. If you think about it, many students will have had the best learning experience they ever could have had. All modules were redesigned. I'm, I, I'm not sure that this has ever happened before. No more just getting out your last year's PowerPoint presentation. No more use of slides and approaches that have been used for years and years without review. That hasn't been possible. Again, as Jessup and, and Al have said, rather than a deficit view of online ed education, Early evidence shows that the sector has showed the value of it. In JISC's Digital Insights Survey, 68% of over 21,000 students res uh, responding rated the quality of online learning as the best imaginable, excellent or good. So we've seen a shift from teaching to learning, and that's what we've all been working for for all for many, many years. But online, as we discovered, isn't good for everything. The challenge for us all will be to identify where the main value of in-person and, onli and online education lies. So although we'll do more things online, we need to work out what's more appropriate to deliver face to face. And this is a critical area that for, for that collaboration that I referred to, collaboration with students and collaboration across staff groups. It should not be just up to us to decide which method we use without talking with students. Willemi et al strongly assert that we should build the next stage in our learning communities as co-creation with students. They say, where it's done well, and there's real joint investment in making it effective, student voice is an enabler of good quality and rapid decision-making. And this then leads to the third theme in my com conversation piece, relationships with staff and students. Perhaps our experience over the last 18 months has allowed us to show more empathy towards everyone. We've all struggled. We've all had to develop a new resilience to look inside ourselves and reevaluate our connections with others and our own organisations and society general. And I think this will need to lead us to develop a philosophy of kindness to how we operate our institutions and how we develop processes and policies. During lockdown, um, I trained as an executive coach and I discovered the work of Lucy Hone. She's an academic in New Zealand working on theoretical models of resilience. And then one day she had an experience which meant that her academic studies came to life. Her 12 year old daughter was killed. And Lucy had to find a way to make sense of the tragedy. Her earlier research work helped and she was able to come up with a three pronged model of resilience. The first part is acceptance. Bad things happen. That's the world state. Things like pandemics happen. But and the second pillar is kindness. So be very kind to yourself and to others because that's what you need to be resilient. And thirdly, be grateful, have gratitude. Aren't I lucky to be what, to have what I have? And this approach, I think, can help us understand the challenges 
that our students and our colleagues are facing as a result of their home and personal circumstances. And this should lead us to an increased use of empathy in communications and a re-evaluation re of what support needs for colleagues and students are in the post-pandemic world, where there is greater awareness of the fragility of life and of our mental health. We mustn't lose that sense of engagement that we found in the pandemic. I was looking at um, what the University of Greenwich, for example, did. They called every student for a one-to-one -one discussion about their needs and issues, and it was much appreciated. It was a personalised experience. And similarly, we need to look at how our staff colleagues will work best. This involves how we run meetings, how much we move back on campus, and what dynamic working really means in a university situation. And I would advocate that uh, a university campus is about innovation and it's about debate and about engagement and it's about the buzz of social interaction and you can't do all that so well on teams. Um, but as well as being kind and considerate, we also need to be, as, as Fraser and colleagues have said, brave and fearless and we were certainly forced to be that in the last year. I ended my conversation article saying, six months ago, the world changed and with it, many accepted approaches to learning and providing a holistic learning ex a student experience. The relationship universities have with students has to change as a result. We have to have more interaction, more innovation, and certainly more flexibility for individual learners, learning situations and approaches for, for all are needed. And I would end this reflection today with the following summary. Actually, just before I summarise, I wanted to say, after writing my first draft of this reflection, I listened to a very insightful podcast by GISC. In it, three vice chancellors from three very different institutions gave their, inst gave their views on what changed for the better in the pandemic. And I'm pleased to say that they concurred quite independently with what I've written down here. In my view, an institution's ongoing resilience will be based on how we manage people. By listening, by collaborating, by supporting, by communicating. And it's not firstly about technology or process or even about organisation. More specifically, it will depend on, and this is, this is my view, getting students' views more continuously, keep listening and talking to them, supporting diverse student groups more systematically, the knowledge of students that the previous point gives brings greater understanding of diverse student cohorts and takes our background know-how to enhance levels. We need to design, deliver and assess learning in a more flexible way. Given that there will still be members of the student population who thrived online and a population who want to be on campus. Don't go for the middle way where no one is satisfied. We, we need to co-create with students. We, meet, we need to be more agile as we've shown that we can be. And this will bring a shift in our reputation from being slow and risk averse. We have licensed for ourselves and our colleagues innovation and risk taking Let's not forget this, and we need to build in that agility, that risk taking. Next, communicate appropriately and a great deal. And then use this lens to target investment, physical hardware and software, but also training and mentoring of staff, i.e. the development of our workforce, which after all in universities is our biggest spend. And finally, 
while maintaining these high standards, be very kind to ourselves and others so that we can feel psychologically safe and resilient and agile and brave and creative and fearless in what we do. Thank you very much.